hello, got Dima Galair, Fonche, good G. Mo Laurelin, sure, is Misha Anton, I was Fonche of Gomani G. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Live Irish Mits. This is episode number 207. I'm Anthony Murphy. I'm your host. For the next hour or so, you will be treated to uh, a mixture of uh, myth and folklore readings, bad dad jokes, and all sorts of shenanigans. Hope that you're all keeping well wherever you are in the world. If you're joining us, please do feel free to say hello. And we'll say hello right back. We began this adventure on the 12th of March in the year of 2020 at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are still going. After all this time, all you desperate folk out there still tuning in every week. My God, have you nothing better to be doing with your lives? Anyway, if you're on YouTube, please do remember to subscribe to the channel if you want notifications for when I'm live and when I upload new videos. Ring the little bell as well. Uh, good evening, first of all, to Guido Bruce, who's the first of the commenters tonight. Guido is watching on Facebook. Good evening to you, uh, Guido. Hope you're well. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter is present and accounted for. That's that name ticked off the list. Very good. Uh, Robin Edgar will be with us shortly. He's rushing up on his knowledge of F words. Uh, Miriam uh, Magot is uh, saying hello from Saint Marcelin in France. Good evening. Bonsoir, mon ami. Miriam, you're very welcome. Brendan Byrne is in Glendalough, where it's a very cold and moonless. Hmm, the moon is up here, uh, Brendan. I think you might want to check that again. Maybe it's behind the mountains where you are. A waxing gibbous yellow moon in the northeast. Wayne Bird is in the house. Good evening, Wayne. You're very welcome to Live Irish Mid. Spike Willow says, hey, hey. Right back at you, Spike. You're very welcome. Are you anything to Spike Milligan? Oh, never mind. And Scott Doherty says, greetings to everyone from rainy, windy County Clare. I'm in fine fettle, as Tom would say. Well, uh, you can keep the rain and the wind over there if you don't mind. Uh, don't send it this way now, uh, please. Uh, you're very welcome to the live stream, Anne, as always. And I hope himself is in the vicinity watching as well. Desiree is in the house. Me and Amadeus are here. And apparently he has started to recognize the music to the Eclipse Countdown. So he's excited. He has the Zoomies, love. And I have Saskia here on the chair last week. Was it last week? I think it was last week she was uh, making herself known. No doubt Coda will make himself known before too long. Adrian Beglin is in the house. Good evening to you and I hope you are keeping well. Facebook user. Oh, apologies, folks. I have to find out who that is. That's probably Anne McCallum, is it? Yes, indeed. That is Anne McCallum. Hello, Anne. See how I knew that? Hello, Anton, because you called me Anton by my Irish name. And all the mighty to uh, hope everyone's doing well. We're still below freezing, but the sun is shining today, so it's lovely. Very much looking forward to part three. It's hard to believe yesterday morning, the 8th, was the last day upon which the sun could still enter the chamber of Newgrange. And I noticed this morning while I was doing the school run, that the sun is still rising very late, but that will change very quickly over the next few weeks. Robin Moonshadow is in the house. Hello, Robin. Robin of the Eclipses. I hope you are keeping well. You're very welcome. The full Irish Gary is in the house, says Jigwich. Great and good to a, another fine day on the sod. Yes, indeed. If a little bit cool, but sure, it's not snowing. It's not raining. It's not windy. It is in County Clare, apparently. But um, Anne Scott Doherty says that she's going to do her best to keep that down there. Mariana Dunn says, Banachty, everyone, and Anthony from sunny Alexandria in Virginia. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, Mariana. Hope you're well. Astro is in Tucson, Arizona, where it's 70 and sunny. Wow, what a boast. What's that in Celsius? Mm -hmm. 70 F2C, the old Google. Wow, 21. Nice. Very nice. That's like a summer day here. Nick S. Casterton is in the house. Hope you're all staying warm and keeping well. Yes, indeed. And likewise, I say the same to everyone. Um, Alan Hoskins is watching from Ballina, Killaloo. Hope uh, all well. Can't stay for the live broadcast, but we'll catch up later. Just checking in. Very good of you to check in, Alan. Alan, and uh, hello, and uh, hope you enjoy the replay. Uh, Carol Barrett is in the house. Trinona, Anthony, and on to a great to be at alive again. Yes, indeed. Well, it's great to have your company. Rex Fortenberry is in Louisiana and says howdy to everyone. A very good afternoon to you, Rex. Robin Moonshadow tells us, uh, is that 
she, she, her, uh, they, them, uh, Robin uh, is in Canada. Cold and no snow. Well, that is a bonus. Being in Canada in January and not having snow is definitely a good thing. John Main is saying hello to everyone from a wet, wet, wet San Francisco Bay Area. I hope everyone is having a fabulous new year. Still wet over there, John. That's unbelievable stuff. And uh, sure, it'll be the opposite in six months' time, you know. Archaeostronomy database swamped with work, but always good to be here with you all. It's very good to have you, Ty. You're very welcome to the live stream. Michael Trott is saying good morning from Auckland in New Zealand, uh, where uh, the weather is rainy. Ah, summer rain doesn't do any harm. You know, it'll keep the grass growing for them sheep. There's a few sheep over there in that direction. Uh, Gary tells us that the moon is spectacular from Tala. Very nice. Elaine says, wouldn't miss you, Anthony, even if I had to stop reserving my B&Bs for my return trip to do so. <laughs> it's good to hear. Uh, Barbara Murphy's in house. Gia Eve, hello all from a bright, sunny Tucson, Arizona. Well, a very good afternoon to you, Barbara. Um, great of you to bring the sunshine. Tom King on Goa is in the house saying hello to everyone. Love the countdown to the broadcast. Like, <laughs> like New Year's Eve all over again. <laughs> Enjoy the story. I will. <laughs> Hope the forge is burning strongly there. That flame can be seen for miles around. Valerie Gallagher says hello there, Anthony and Tua. Joining in from sunny and brisk Rhode Island. A very good afternoon to all the Rhode Islanders. Valerie, you're very welcome. Apple 369 is in Vancouver in British Columbia, where it's just past midday. Mild and rainy here. Sounds very Irish. Monica Regley is saying hi all from a stormy and rainy Switzerland. Stay safe, Monica. Hope you're well. Robin says, that's right, lol. Always light behind the darkness in relation to the moon shadow. Yes, yes, yes. Mary Shields is in the house. Hi all. Good evening, Trinonawa, uh, Mary uh, Peter Kennedy is watching from a chilly Balbriggan in County Dublin. Peter, you're very welcome. Uh, who else have we got? Helen Hurst Chatter is watching from the Black Hills of South Dakota, where it's just above freezing. Wow. Cold. In no time at all, we'll be going, oh, Jesus, very warm. I have all the windows open and we'll be saying, do you remember the winter when the broadcast was on and we were all complaining of the cold? Cloda is a Cloda Bob says, uh, Blaine Noah, if we wash a G of Galer, a happy new year to you, uh, Cloda, and many happy returns. For some reason, I mistakenly joined the community again. I think that's why I'm coming in as FB user and can't see the comments. Hopefully, I'm back on track now. Well, you are, and and there's no harm. Uh, I wasn't able to stream direct to the community for a long time, but I, I am. But the only downside is if somebody comments on the Mythical Ireland community on Facebook on the live stream. Uh, it only says Facebook user, and I have to identify who it is by going to Facebook. Kathleen Gallagher is saying good day all from a chilly New York. Uh, how's all in the Big Apple, Kathleen? Is that, can't remember if you're in New York City or uh, some part of New York State. But anyway, you're very, very welcome. Adina Sparks is saying it's a chilly and breezy day here in New Mexico. Wow, chilly. I, I believe New Mexico is one of the warmer states, though, isn't it? Wouldn't generally get too cold probably gets cold at night maybe there's mountains down is new mexico is a very dry state isn't it am i am i right albuquerque and all that erica bows in the house hello erica Folge. and how are you connus at all too uh mokara i'm all up to date with the comments well i mean there's only kind of one really big thing to say which is watch what the ticker is saying at the bottom of the screen uh we are i'm delighted to say uh, in a position to announce that as and from today, you can now get Mythical Ireland merchandise on the website. What do I mean when I'm talking about merchandise? Because at the moment I have books for sale, my own work, of course, uh, a poster, uh, a calendar, the 2023 Mythical Ireland calendar. Still have plenty of those if you want to order one. Uh, hand forged uh, artworks from the very talented hands of Angawa, Tom King. I have my Mythical Ireland letter opener here, which gets regular use. And I also, as you all very well know, I wear my uh, Triscoll pendant every day. And it's got a lovely pattern on it now. Um, uh, what else did we have? Oh, yes, the gift card. Now there's an extra. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And uh, we'll navigate this for a moment before we turn to part three of our exploration of James George Fraser's The Golden Bow. This week, I've chosen to read a section about the corn spirit or the corn god. 
And I think we'll find some interesting parallels with Irish and Boyne Valley uh, mythology there. Uh, bear with me one moment while I just try to share my screen with you so that we can navigate this this website, you know, that is called Mythical Island. Okay. Now, I hope that you are able to... Uh, you will be able to see it now, I hope. There you go. So there's the Mythical Ireland website and the homepage. So it's mythicalireland.com or actually, I'm going to show you this. If you type mythicalireland.ie, that's the Irish uh, uh, web domain, and hit it, it should just redirect you to mythicalireland.com. So mythicalireland.ie will work as well. In mythicalireland.com, scroll over to shop. And look, you have books, photographic... Oh, I forgot about the photos. How could I forget about the photos? Hand-forged artwork, calendar, merchandise, and Mythical Ireland gift card. What do we mean when we talk about merchandise? Well, let's have a quick look, shall we? Well, look, uh, these are uh, best-selling. These are, I haven't sold any yet because these only went up today. But anyway, um, so, uh, for instance, you have the uh, uh, poster, uh, Nouth poster. Now, that's available... If you make a donation of, is it 10 euros or more to Mythical Ireland, you get a PDF copy of that. But now there are physical copies. And look, you can select your size. And as you select your size, the poster gets bigger and the lady shows you how big it is. Look at that, 24 by 36 inch. Wow, nice. There are mugs. So, for instance, the Newgrange Entrance Stone mug. And again, there are different views of that. You can scroll down. You can, by the way, Buy as many of those as you want. Uh, the quantity is uh, selectable there. There is, for instance, the Fornox Chamber mug. That's not the best series of images because it doesn't show you the center of the chamber. There are three recesses and it wraps around the mug nicely. And there's, for instance, the Fog at Newgrange mug, which, which I highly recommend for your cup of tea when you're sitting down to watch live Irish myths. Anyway, what else is there other than mugs? There is, for instance, a tote bag for all the ladies. Or maybe, if it's your thing, maybe some of the men want a tote bag. That's got a, an image of Newgrange, uh, Sheed and Broga, and it's uh, Cursus, lovely uh, winter aerial shot there taken with the drone. There's pillowcases. Look at this. Newgrange light beam pillowcases. And you select your size. Watch what happens to the picture when I select the size. Watch this. Different pillows appear. Look, oh, look, oh, I, I highly recommend the 22 inch by 22 inch. Uh, that's got to be uh, an absolute uh, prerequisite to sitting watching uh, live Irish myths. Uh, there is the baseball cap. Again, uh, you can select your color and uh, different views there. Uh, there is a metal print. Oh, jigsaw puzzles. Yes. People have been saying that to me for ages. So there's, for instance, the Nouth Curbstone 15 jigsaw puzzle. You can have the 252-piece puzzle. I would highly recommend. Make it a little bit more challenging for yourself and go for the 520-piece puzzle. There are several, uh, there's a couple of other jigsaws. Hang, hang on till I find those first. Uh, there is the Newgrange Curbstone 52 jigsaw. Again, highly recommend the more difficult one. The other one would probably be too easy to do. And the Newgrange full moon set uh jigsaw uh, uh you know, so uh, something that you absolutely have to without any shadow of a doubt uh where if you're watching live irish myths is the i watch live irish myths uh t-shirt there's one for men and you can select uh, various colors look at that so I can picture you all sitting watching Live Irish Mits wearing your I Watch Live Irish Mits. And look, there's one for the ladies as well. I Watch Live Irish Mits uh, t-shirt. What do you think of that? Uh, there's the Newgrange uh, Moonset water bottle. Oh, there's loads. Oh, look, there's, 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 I must actually make a ladies version of that. Oh, it's unisex. Apologies. Yes, indeed. The sweatshirt. I Watch Live Irish Mits. And on the back, look. MythicalIreland.com. Isabel Collins is asking, did I miss much? No, just telling people about the new Mythical Ireland merchandise uh, that's available on the website uh, before we get to our reading. And uh, last year, 
some people are giving out on Facebook and I told them to get over themselves. And as several people suggested I should make T-shirts with get over yourselves on them. So I did. So you can also get a get over yourselves T-shirt for women and there's versions for men as well. So there you go in different colors and sizes. There's uh, phone covers. So for instance, if you have a Samsung, uh, you can select all manner of, if you have say the Galaxy S21 Plus, and that's a lovely image of the light streaming into Newgrange. There's also an, uh, an iPhone case, a tough iPhone case. You can get that in gloss or matte, and you can get all sorts of variations on the iPhone for the cover. Uh, again, another pillow. A uh, lovely Mythical Ireland pillow for you to watch your, and a throw blanket with Curbstone 52 on it. Um, a great addition. Again, get yourself comfortable. So you've got your mug with your tea in it. You've got your I Watch Live Irish Mits t-shirt. You've got your throw. You've got your cushion. You know, you've got your bag if you have something. You and if you want to take notes, there's even a spiral notebook with Newgrange on the cover. Look at that. Um, so this is a third party uh, company that's dealing with this. So if you order anything uh, through the website, it, they're dispatched. If you're in the States, it's dispatched from the States. If you're in Europe, it's dispatched from Europe. So you only pay, as it were, local postage rates. Uh, unfortunately, one of the downsides of selling books and, and photos on the Internet is the Irish postal rates are quite high. Um, oh, yeah, the candle. Don't forget to light your wax candle just to keep a little bit of light um the new grange moonset candle if you want to kind of keep the place nice. and even if you you know if you're listening uh, to the episode through your airpods uh, you can get a new grange light beam airpods case as well i mean all manner of stuff anyway the address for that is mythicalireland.com forward slash collections forward slash merchandise but the easiest way to navigate to it is from the home page go to shop and click on merchandise and that is your whole selection all there um so uh, next week i expect to see see i don't see any of you but when we do uh, our next zoom uh, i expect to see uh, a few at least a few i watch live irish mints t-shirts so don't forget to uh, uh get over there and uh, get your uh, mythical ireland merchandise uh, uh, so the third party means that i don't handle uh, the packaging and the postage that all happens seamlessly you order through the website and the order is handled and hopefully all dispatched within a certain short amount of time. Some of the uh, products have uh, not a warning on them, but or a disclaimer, but a, a paragraph that says this product is made specially for you as soon as you place an order, which is why it takes us a bit longer to deliver, to deliver. Making products on demand instead of in bulk helps reduce overproduction. So thank you for making thoughtful purchasing decisions. One of the reasons I've decided to go this route, as opposed to getting a whole load of mugs and posters and T-shirts printed and having them lying around in boxes, uh, which and we don't have the space. You can see here behind me that the shelves are already overloaded. Um, it's better just to do it on an ad hoc basis, one order at a time. Uh, not sure what the dispatch uh, times are like for most items because I haven't used this company before, uh, but I've spoken to somebody today at length uh, who uses it and they highly recommend it. And the quality of the stuff is supposed to be excellent. That's all I can say. So uh, Mythical Ireland merchandise now available on the website. Anyway, who else has joined us? Um, yes, indeed, John Main, Sheed and Broga. I can't stop using that name, the proper name, you know. Monica tells us that she's munching uh, Swiss Williams pear licorice chocolate. Wow, that sounds very nice. Uh, wow, somebody's been busy, says Anne McCallum. The answer to many presents, yes, itself. Yes, indeed. Get over ye self is my own phrase used with the Irish accent. It sounds good. Drinking tea now no t-shirt yet that's okay michael it could take a while to get there in fairness you are on the other side of the world spike willow is liking the merch brilliant stuff i would so buy code a coda shirt for amadeus i love that idea actually Anne said that to me today you could get a t-shirt with, with the the live irish myths dogs on it with coda on one side and saskia on the other uh which i think i might do uh, you never know um doesn't cost me anything to upload the images and to create the design just a time that's all you know um barbara murphy says gotta finish organizing my house then jigsaw puzzle here i come and you know what the possibilities are endless i mean i have thousands of photographs if there's a photograph that you want by the way please do feel free to reach out by email or by message afterwards if for instance you say 
I liked the candle, but I preferred this image. Could you put this image on the candle? Yes, I can, is the short answer. It, 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 there's very little work involved in it from my point of view. Or if you liked the notebook and you want a different picture on the notebook, or if you like the T-shirt but you want it to say something slightly different, absolutely. Get in touch. Let me know what you want. It's easy peasy. It only takes five minutes. Oh, I love that one shirt. Waiting for my calendar to arrive, says Tara. You're Yes, and I hope... Tara, uh, so um, the way the website works is when it's dispatched here, uh, you should get a notification that it was dispatched. Uh, I'm hoping that you did. And I wonder, did you? Maybe you might indicate that in the comments. If you don't want to, that's uh, perfectly OK. Um, but just in case, um, I, when I, as I say, when I uh, process the order, uh, I will, I will uh, click a dispatch button and that should give you a notification that the item has been dispatched. If there's a tracking number with it, you should also get the tracking number. Uh, there's Adrian. And what about Coda merchandise for Amadeus? There you go. Er, great minds think alike, you know. Some great things on offer, says Elaine. Uh, Adina says, I need to shop now. Uh, me, me and Mrs. Penny are jigsaw addicts, says uh, Desiree. Going to have to get one. So much cool stuff. Love, love, love all the new merchandise. One suggestion, need shirts for the puppies. I wonder. Don't think that was an option, but I'll have a look. Definitely. Definitely. Anyway. Oh, great. Uh, the site says it can't be shipped to the address entered. I entered everything correctly. Do you wonder what, what? item that was and see this is there are going to be little teething problems this is the first time i've been using this service hopefully uh, most people will be able to order stuff seamlessly uh without any uh difficulty but um you know i i know that when i was creating um when i was creating some items today it did say for instance the mug the black mug is only available in the states so I put US only in brackets after it. I even used my Ireland address, says Anne. Hmm. Well, maybe uh, when you're uh, when we're finished, you might send me an email about what you were trying to order and just maybe a screenshot. That would be helpful. Right. Shall we get on with it, as they say? What time are we on? 23 minutes past eight. Tonight, we are back with James Fraser. Uh, Sir James George Fraser's Golden Bow, which we've been... Uh, finding some golden nuggets in uh, and uh, uh, we've been jumping around a bit. We were talking about the, the rituals of certain kings and especially, you know, when kings were seen to be failing uh, uh, or um, when they were getting sick or showing signs of age that in some countries they were just killed and in some countries killed by their wives and families and some countries buried alive. It's, I mean, it's bizarre stuff. We last week explored uh, Dionysus. Uh, we had a very interesting exploration of Dionysus, which tied in uh, to a degree with Osiris and a little bit to some of the dismemberment uh, mythology of Ireland and in particular the Boyne Valley. Tonight we are going to the corn spirit. Now I'm not reading from the beginning of the chapter because there's quite a lot about the corn spirit as different animals. And I'm going to concentrate tonight on the corn spirit as a bull, a cow or an ox, followed by corn spirit as a horse or mare, the corn spirit as a pig, because these are all creatures that are seen in Irish mythology uh, and uh, and other animal uh, embodiments of the corn spirit. So I hope you're all comfortable. Some of you have this book and will be able to read along and then <laughs> yes, and then you will be able to see where I'm making mistakes and go oh, he's got it wrong again. Hmm, yes indeed. Desiree is thinking I should convince Anthony to start a Dogs of Mythical Ireland page. Yeah. Uh, is that just going to be Amadeus, Coda and Saskia? I mean, is there going to be anybody else on that? You know, I, I'm not sure. There aren't. I mean, I know there are other people who watch with dogs, but you're the only one who regularly mentions your dog. I and mean, you're the only one whose uh, dog I know the name of, I think. Ah, Michael Trott says the Golden Bow is soon to be dispatched here. Uh, corn god spirits and merchants galore yes onwards little kings dionysus was interesting last time yeah i thought dionysus was fascinating alan hoskins i'm back plan b i can watch live brilliant stuff alan that's great you got off whatever it was you had to do um uh, adrian begdon says i think we just started a new line of mythical ireland pet products <laughs> uh brilliant uh these are all funny you are i mean honestly i mean i think that i'm funny uh, now I'm the only one who thinks I'm funny. 
Um, and I think that, you know, you were funny. So a husband and wife are having a row and the wife says to the husband, I'm sick of your obsession with dinosaurs. Even our son was affected by it. And the husband says, hey, don't pull Alberto Soros into this. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, yes, I had that one last week, didn't I? Oh, haven't I? No, I didn't. I played poker against an origami expert last night. It was a bit of a waste of time. He kept folding. Uh, that's all I have for now. Mariana says, my dogs are Keegan and Callie. Hello, Keegan and Callie. Woof, woof to you. Bow, wow. Uh, Newgrange t-shirt on the way. We'll order the sheet in Broga as soon as it's available, says John. Brilliant stuff. I don't think there are any words on the t-shirts. That's just the description I put in the product description. Uh, so there are no words. It's just a picture. Uh, but yes, it wouldn't do any harm to have uh, t-shirts available with the old name of Newgrange. Not the old name, the name of Newgrange. Newgrange is an interloper. As we all know. Anyway, I better get started. Alan says, Ernie Terrier and Saoirse, pet greyhound, are regular viewers. They find you. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a ringing endorsement, to Alan, to say that the dogs find me funny. But, you know, I mean, I'll take any uh, applaud, uh, any, any plaudits I can get. Sandra Boothroyd is in the house. Good evening, Sandra. How about a mythical Ireland bandana scarf that Amadeus could wear? I think that there may have been scarves or something similar. I'll have a look at that later. Absolutely. Uh, challenge accepted. Now, there's a great T-shirt with the picture of the, the fire, uh, the forge burning away. Yeah, well, that sounds good, Tom. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Main Squeeze Louise. Oh, yes. Rarely misses an episode. How could I forget Main Squeeze Louise, uh, Barb? Well, I'm going to have to take a list. I'm going to have to take a list of all the people who are late to, you know, as I do. But I'm also going to take a list of the doggies and tick them off as they arrived. Uh, Melissa O'Brien says hello from Killarney. A very good evening to you, Melissa. I hope uh, apparently it's raining and windy in County Clare. I hope it's uh, uh, nice down in Killarney. Uh, it's always nice in Killarney, says you, you know. Now you are in the doghouse, Anthony, says Brendan. Well, a truer word was never spoken. The corn spirit as a bull, cow or ox. Forge ahead, says Michael Trump. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, yes. Tom has never heard that one before. I know. I joke. I jest. But yes. Uh, the jokes are a bit woof sometimes, but keep them coming. <laughs> mm. Tara White says, love to buy a dog scarf for my dog, Coda. My Coda loves her scarf. I think I'm going to have to find a solution to this issue of dog scarves with something mythical Irelandish on them. Another form which the corn spirit often assumes is that of a bull, cow, or ox. When the wind sweeps over the corn, they say at Konitz in West Prussia, quote, the steer is running the corn, unquote. When the corn is thick and strong in one spot, they say in some parts of East Prussia, this goes to show you how long ago this book was written. He's talking about Prussia. Quote, the bull is lying in the corn, unquote. When a harvester has overstrained and lamed himself, they say in the Graudens district of West Prussia, quote, the bull pushed him, unquote. In Lorraine, I presume that's in France, Lorraine, they say, quote, he has the bull, unquote. Fascinating stuff. Hang on a second. <clears throat> Somebody telling me dogs' names here on the Mythical Ireland community. I must find out who that is. We have Muffin, is it Hebe, Minnie and Lottie all enjoying Coda and Respond. That is, who is that? I don't know who that is because it hasn't, hang on, I have to refresh that. That's what it is. Apologies. That is Sue Prenter. Hello, Sue. And uh, four. Wow. I think you have a, at least a, a one or maybe a couple of rescue dogs, which is a, a, such a wonderful thing to do. The poor little puppies that were abandoned or injured or unclaimed or whatever. Yeah, Desiree is very excited. I knew we had more Mythical Ireland pets. Lots of kitties tune in too. That's a whole other conversation, that one. You know, uh, Peter Woods has joined us from Monaster Boyce. Happy New Year. Many happy returns. Uh, Peter, hope Santa was good. 
Um, I hope you're keeping well. Miriam uh, Eckert is saying that hers is a rescue dog as well. Fantastic stuff. Lovely, lovely. The meaning of both expressions is that he has unwittingly lighted upon the divine corn spirit. Did somebody mention Coda? Oh, good. Short-lived. Who has punished the profane intruder with lameness. So near Chambéry, when a reaper wounds himself with his sickle, it is said that he has, quote, the wound of the ox, unquote. In the district of Bunslau in Silesia, Where's Silesia? That's in a European country. That's is that to do with the Silesian order? Is that in is that in Italy? Please pardon my ignorance. Somebody will tell me. Silesia. S S I L E S I A. Silesia. In the district of Bunslau, Silesia, the last sheaf is sometimes made into the shape of a horned ox stuffed with toe. T O W? Tow? Toe? and wrapped in corn ears. This figure is called the old man. Of course, we have the last corn uh, was formed into the Kalyak, wasn't it? Uh, Adina tells us that Coda's bark just brought my dog, Bowen, running. <laughs> Valerie says near Poland. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and part Poland. Okay. Uh, uh, Czech Republic, sorry, is where Silesia is, and part Poland. Ah, I apologize. Somebody else, uh, Michael Trot. Thank you. Thank you uh, for filling me in, folks. I did not know the location of Silesia. In some parts of Bohemia, the last chief is made up in human form and called the Buffalo Bull. Not to be mistaken with, not to be misidentified as Buffalo Bill. Saskia, did you? What? Are you whimpering? I gave you chicken. She got chicken when we finished our dinner. She got nice cooked chicken. And now there are people eating in the kitchen and she's like, I want more food. <laughs> you couldn't still be hungry. Oh, hang on. She's a dog. Dogs are always hungry. Coda's certainly always hungry. These cases show a confusion of the human with the animal shape of the corn spirit. The confusion is like that of killing a weather under, under the name of a wolf. Oh, Saskia is making her voice heard. Something we used to not hear very much of on Live Irish Myths until she actually moved into this room. So there you go. You're hearing new sounds. All over Swabia, the last bundle of corn on the field is called the cow. The man who cuts the last ears, quote, has the cow, unquote, and is himself called cow or barley cow or oats cow, according to the crop. At the harvest supper, he gets a nosegay of flowers and corn ears and a more liberal allowance of drink than the rest. That sounds very Irish, to be honest, you know. Maureen O'Leary is in the house. Uh, Happy New Year, Maureen. Long time no see. I hope you are keeping well. You're very welcome to the library. But he is teased and laughed at, so no one likes to be the cow. The cow was sometimes represented by the figure of a woman made out of ears of corn and corn flowers. The aforementioned Kalyak uh, of uh, Irish um, uh, harvest traditions. The children ran after him and the neighbours turned out to laugh at him till the farmer took the cow from him. Here again, the confusion between the human and the animal form of the corn, corn spirit is apparent. In various parts of Switzerland, the reaper who cuts the last years of corn is called wheat cow, corn cow, cow, oats cow, or corn steer, and is the butt of many a joke. On the other hand, well, I suppose in that case, you just make sure you're not last. On the other hand, in the, districts, uh, in the district of uh, Rosenheim, Upper Bavaria, when a farmer is later of getting in his harvest than his neighbours, they set up on his land a straw bull, as it is called. This is a gigantic figure of a bull made of stubble on a framework of wood and adorned with flowers and leaves. Attached to it is a label on which are scrawled doggerel verses in ridicule of the man on whose land the straw bull is set up. Wow, I hope they all took it very well, you know. 
I know, Mythical Ireland Pet Market is a completely untapped merchandise gold mine, says Desiree. It seems so. Ah, Peter says the office, sorry, the office, office gear 36. Peter says the family surprised me for Christmas and gave me a collie pup. I called him Louis or Lou at the moment. It's little Lou. Lovely, lovely. The hound of Lou. Fall inish, is it? Oh, fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant. Love the cat's name, Master Yoda, says Adrian. <laughs> I love hearing about everyone's fur babies. Now nah, let's just abandon the golden bow and talk about dogs and cats. <laughs> I joke. Jay Brown says, hello and good evening all. You're very welcome, Jay, to the live stream. Thank you for joining us. Again, the corn spirit in the form of a bull or ox is killed on the harvest field at the close of the reaping. At Pouilly, near D Dijon, where when the last years of corn or do you like my French pronunciation? It's probably terrible, really, but I mean, at least it sounds like I'm making an effort. Uh, when the last ears of corn are about to be cut, an ox adorned with ribbons, flowers and ears of corn is led all around the field, followed by the whole troop of reapers dancing. Then a man disguised as the devil cuts the last ears of corn and immediately slaughters the ox. Part of the flesh of the animal is eaten at the har harvest supper. Part is pickled and kept till the first day of sowing in spring. Oh, that's the end of the sentence. At pont a mousson uh, and elsewhere, on the evening of the last day of reaping, a, a calf adorned with flowers and ears of corn is led thrice around the farmyard, being allured by a bait or driven by men with sticks or conducted by the farmer's wife with a rope. The calf chosen for this ceremony is the calf which was born first on the farm in the spring of the year. It is followed by all the reapers with their tools. Then it is allowed to run free. The reapers chase it and whoever catches it is called king of the calf. Lastly, it is solemnly killed at Luneville. Uh, Luneville. Luneville. The man who acts as butcher is the Jewish merchant of the, the village. He says in a very French accent, which doesn't sound very French. Bev Davis is in the house. You're very welcome to the live stream, Bev. Thank you for joining us. Hope you are well. New group, Mythical Ireland Pet Community. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. Sometimes, again, the corn spirit hides himself amongst the cut corn in the barn to reappear in bull or cow form at threshing. Thus at Wormlingen in Thuringen, the man who gives the last stroke at threshing is called the cow, or rather the barley cow, oats cow, peas cow, or the like, according to the crop. He is entirely enveloped in straw, his head is surmounted by sticks in imitation of horns, and two lads lead him by ropes to the well to drink. On the way thither, he must low like a cow, and for a long time afterwards, he goes by the name of the cow. At Obermedlingen in Swabia, when the threshing draws near an end, each man is careful to avoid giving the last stroke. He who does it, quote, gets the cow, unquote, which is a straw figure dressed in an old ragged petticoat, hood and stockings. It is tied on his back with a straw rope, his face is blackened, and being bound with straw ropes to a wheelbarrow, he is wheeled round the village. Quite a humiliating experience, I think you'll agree. Here again we meet with that confusion between the human and animal shape of the corn spirit, which we have noted in other customs. In Canton Schaffhausen, the man who threshes the last corn <coughs> is called the cow. In Canton Thurgau, the corn bull, in Canton Zurich, the thresher cow. In the last mentioned district, he is wrapped in straw and bound to one of the trees in the orchard. At Arad in Hungary, Hungary, a man who gives the last stroke at threshing is enveloped in straw and a cow's hide with the, thor with the horns attached to it. Wow, all very bizarre. Stephen King story suggests Brendan. <laughs> it's a bit like that, isn't it? Yes, indeed. At Pesnitz in the district of Dresden, the man who gives the last stroke with the flail is called Bull. 
he must make a straw man and set it up before a neighbor's window. Here, apparently, as in so many cases, the corn spirit is passed on to a neighbor who has not finished threshing. Excuse me, apologies. So at Herbrechtingen in Thuringen, the effigy of a ragged old woman is flung into the barn of the farmer who is last with his threshing. I mean, it's obviously, I mean, there's a whole kind of social thing there. It's like bringing shame on he or she who is the last one to uh, to to bring in the corn, as it were. I mean, just make sure that you harvest early or we'll get it done before everyone else is finished. Uh, Monica says, I never heard those expressions in Switzerland and I live there. There you go. Um, I, yeah, I wonder. Yeah, this is, I, I know this was written a long time ago. Um, is this early, yeah, 1922. It's a, it's, a, it's just over a century old, this book. Um, so I wonder at these older customs, but that doesn't mean you wouldn't hear, hear, hear of them now. Where was I? Where was I? The man who throws it in, cries, that is uh, at uh, Herbrechtingen in Thuringen. The effigy of a ragged old woman is flung into the barn of the farmer who is last with his threshing. The man who throws it in, cries, there is the cow for you. If the threshers catch him, they detain him overnight and punish him by keeping him from the harvest supper. Oh, well, that sounds to be a lot worse than having a cowhide thrown over you and being ridiculed. In these, <laughs> being kept from my meal. In the in these latter customs, the confusion between the human and the animal shape, the human and the animal shape of the corn spirit meets us again. Further, the corn spirit in bull form is sometimes believed to be killed at threshing. At Auxerre, in threshing the last bundle of corn, they call out 12 times, we are killing the bull. In the neighbourhood of Bordeaux, where a butcher kills an ox on the field immediately after the close of the reaping, it is said of the man who gives the last stroke at threshing that, quote, he has killed the bull, unquote. Yeah, that would be scary, Desiree. But well, you could make a t-shirt with some of Anthony's jokes. Hmm. If you want to get eggs and tomato, rotten tomatoes thrown at you, then that's the thing to do. Kathy May Deo is in the house during her lunch break. Hello, Kathy May. You're very welcome to the live stream. I hope you are well, and I hope that you are uh, in good form and uh, not uh, in a rush back to work. At Chambéry, the last chief is called the chief of the young ox, and a race takes place to it in which all the reapers join. When the last stroke is given at threshing, they say that the ox is killed. Sorry. And immediately thereupon, a real ox is slaughtered by the reaper who cut the last corn. The flesh of the ox is eaten by the threshers at supper. So a lot of similarities in some of these customs. We have seen that sometimes the young corn spirit, whose task it is to quicken the corn of the coming year, is believed to be born as a corn baby on the harvest field. Similarly, in Berry, the young corn spirit is, that's B-E-R-R-Y, not B-U-R-Y in England. Uh, Berry, I don't know where Berry is. Uh, uh, the young corn spirit is sometimes supposed to be born on the field in calf form. For when a binder has not rope enough to bind all the corn in sheaves, he puts aside the wheat that remains over and imitates the lowing of a cow. The meaning is that, quote, the sheaf has given birth to a calf, unquote. In Puy de, Puy de Dome, when a binder cannot keep up with the reaper whom he or she follows, they say he or she is giving birth to the calf. In some parts of Prussia, in similar circumstances, <clears throat> they call out to the woman, the bull is coming, and imitate the bellowing of a bull. In these cases, the woman is conceived as the corn cow or old corn spirit, while the supposed calf is the corn calf or young corn spirit. In some parts of Austria, a mythical calf, uh, I'll pronounce this desperately, but Mokalabken, is believed to be seen amongst the sprouting corn in spring and to push the children 
when the corn waves in the wind, they say the calf is going about. Clearly, as Manhart observes, this calf of the springtime is the same animal which is afterwards believed to be killed at reaping. Fascinating stuff. <coughs> the corn spirit as a horse or mare. What's the story, Saskia? You saying hello? Come here. Come on. Come here. No, you don't like being handled. Close enough. Like, no, I don't. I don't like being handled. I don't. I'm t I'm t <laughs> ah, does it to prove? Like, nope. Big, big difference between Saskia and Coda. Coda cannot get enough of the handling and the rubbing, and he will. If you stop rubbing him, he will then poke his nose under your arm or jump up on you uh, to say, "Oh, please, do not stop." Saskia, on the other hand, if sometimes you give a rub, she shakes her head as if to say, uh, "Don't do that again." You know, I like it and all that, but isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I know. What's the truth? Did, did they not give you more chicken? Is that what it is? Well, you. Oh, yeah. You tell them it's not good enough. You tell them I want more. God damn it! Extra portions. <laughs> ah. So uh, Saskia is a uh, Siberian husky. Um, she does have a slightly uh, wolfish look, as uh, Anna Liffey has uh, uh, pointed out. And that's the second time, only the second time I brought Saskia up onto the chair during a live stream, and she did exactly the same thing last time. She stayed for a couple of seconds and she said, no, can't handle it. <laughs> yes. Sometimes the corn spirit appears in the shape of a horse or mare. Between Kal... Kalwa, K A L W, which is probably in Germany because it's between there and Stuttgart. So it's probably Kalv. Is it Kalv? Kalv? Between Kalv and Stuttgart, when the corn bends before the wind, they say, There runs the horse. At Bolingen, near uh, Rado Radovzel in Baden, the last chief of oats is called the Oats Stallion. In Hertfordshire, that's uh, I presume in England, at the end of the reaping, there is or used to be observed a ceremony called, quote, crying the mare, unquote. The last blades of corn left standing on the field are tied together and called the mare. The reapers stand at a distance and throw their sickles at it. He who cuts it through, quote, has the prize with acclamations and good cheer, unquote. <laughs> very true, Adrian. <laughs> very true. And she didn't even tell any jokes, you know. Reluctant guest star, says Valerie. Yes. Uh, 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 that was auto sync. Saskia is a great name, uh, says Rose. Yeah, we kind of derailed this episode with all the pup talk. <laughs> no harm. The doggies have to have their moment, you know. Their 15 seconds of fame or their seven and a half seconds before they decide. Isabel Collins, oh, puppy is adorable. <laughs> husky is 11. She's a small husky. She's always been a bit on the small side. But I tell you, she's not small when it comes to personality, especially when she wants to tell you what she wants for the dinner, you know. After it is cut, the reapers cry thrice with a loud voice. I have her. Other ants, others answer thrice, who have you? A mare, a mare, a mare. Who is she? Is next asked thrice. A little bit of pantomime here. A, B's, naming the owner thrice. Whither will you send her? To C, D, naming some other neighbour who has not reaped all his corn. In this custom, the corn spirit in the form of a mare is passed on from a farm where the corn is all cut to another farm where it is still standing, and where, therefore, the corn spirit may be supposed naturally to take refuge. In Shropshire, the custom is similar. The farmer who finishes his harvest last, and who therefore cannot send the mare to anyone else, is said to keep her all the winter. Not difficult, that, says Peter. I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to. Not difficult to get a laugh for my jokes? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the mocking offer of the mayor to a laggard neighbour was sometimes responded to by a mocking acceptance of her help. Thus an old man told an inquirer, quote, while we won at supper, 
a man coming we a author a halter to fetch to fetch her away i don't know what accent that is supposed to be it's quite extreme unquote at one place a real mare used to be sent but the man who rode her was subjected to some rough treatment at the farmhouse to which he paid his unwelcome visit i'll well, say if you're coming around to um admonish and ridicule me because i'm the last to uh, do my harvest then i'll probably give you a bit of grief on the way over in the neighborhood of lille the idea of the corn spirit in horse form is clearly preserved when a harvester grows weary at his work it is said quote he has the fatigue of the horse unquote the first chief called the cross of the horse is placed on a cross of boxwood in the barn and the youngest horse on the farm must tread on it the reapers dance around the last blades of corn crying see the remains of the horse the sheaf made out of the last blades is given to the youngest horse of the parish or commune to eat this youngest horse of the parish clearly represents as manhart say says the corn spirit of the following year the corn foal which absorbs the spirit of the old corn horse by eating the last corn cut. For, as usual, the old corn spirit takes his final refuge in the last sheaf. The thresher of the last sheaf is said to beat the horse. This is all interesting from the point of view of the lawyer Vaughan and other traditions in Ireland, uh, where, uh, uh, is that a Samhain tradition? It is, uh, where kids uh, dress up uh there's 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 a, a a white mare that's made as it were uh, and the kids parade around with it and singing and dancing and calling to doors uh and it's interesting that it's a Samhain tradition because that would represent the end of the harvest i wonder is that related to all of the foregoing and then we have the milky way one of which names in irish is uh, arable uh, nalalach bonyu uh, which is the uh the tail of the white mare uh, uh, or the trail of the white mare uh, and i suspect that i suggested this in my island of the setting sun definitely and possibly in my mythical ireland book uh, that uh, that's related to the white cow which was dismembered bowen uh, and uh, that you know the the the, the white mare uh, ceremony the ceremonial dismemberment of the white white mare was a kingship rite in ireland we can now move on to the corn spirit as a pig. The golden bough sounds anthropological. I think it mostly is, Michael. The white mare in Ireland and Wales, absolutely a, a ditto. Yes, indeed. Uh, Marcus has joined us. I was eating dinner. Good Irish shepherd's pie and vegetables. Fantastic stuff. Very nice. You know, old dating profile info. I've never been the horse or cow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. The last animal embodiment of the corn spirit, which we shall notice, is the pig, quote, or sorry, brackets, boar or sow, unquote, un, un, close bracket, un bracket. <laughs> Apologies. In Thuringen, when the wind sets the young corn in motion, they sometimes say the boar is rushing through the corn. Amongst the Estonians in the island of Oysel, the last chief is called the rye boar, and the man who gets it is saluted with a cry of, you have the rye boar on your back. In reply, he strikes up a song in which he prays for plenty. At Kohlerwinkel near Augsburg, at the close of the harvest, the last bunch of standing corn is cut down, stalk by stalk, by all the reapers in turn. He who cuts the last stalk gets the sow and is laughed at. <laughs> Here we go again, admonished or ridiculed for being the last. Uh, or has the rye sow. At Bolingen near Radolfzell in Baden, the last chief is called the rye sow or the wheat sow, according to the crop. And at Rurenbach in Baden, the person who brings the last armful for the last chief is called the corn sow or the oats sow. At Friedringen in Swabia, the thresher who gives the last stroke is called sow barley, sorry, sow, barley sow, corn sow, or the like, again, according to the crop. Robin Moonshadow says, you just gave me an idea for supper. 
bacon and corn. Yes. The white horse symbols on the hill, says Adrian. Good point. Yes, indeed. But Bev Davis suggests or tells us that the sacrifice of the white mare was also done among the Norse and Vedic Indians. Didn't know that. Wow. A more widespread tradition, apparently. Where was I? Where was I? Oh, I don't know where I was. Yes. At Onstmettingen, the man who gives the last stroke at threshing, quote, has the sow, unquote. He is often bound up in a sheaf and dragged by a rope along the ground. Doesn't exactly seem like harmless fun, does it? And generally in Swabia, the man who gives the last stroke with the flail is called sow. He may, however, rid himself of this invidious distinction by passing on to a neighbour the straw rope, which is the badge of his position as sow. So he goes to a house and throws the straw rope into it, crying, There, I bring you the sow. All the inmates give chase. And if they catch him, they beat him, shut him up for several hours in the pig's die, and oblige him to take the sow away again. Wow. You definitely don't want to be the last one to uh, uh, to uh, re reap the, uh, the corn, uh, folks. Just saying. Don't be the last. In various parts of Upper Bavaria, the man who gives the last stroke at threshing must carry the pig. That is either a straw effigy of a pig or merely a bundle of straw ropes. This he carries to a neighboring farm where the threshing is not finished and throws it into the barn. If the threshers catch him, they handle him roughly, beating him. Throw him to the floor. <laughs> roughly, <laughs> throw him to the floor. Yes. Swank him, Centurion, very roughly. <laughs> Blackening or dirtying his face, throwing him into filth. <laughs> Striking him. Uh, binding the sow on his back, and so on. If the bearer of the sow is a woman, they cut off her hair. My God, what an utter disgrace. At the harvest supper or dinner, the man who carried the pig gets one or more dumplings made in the form of pigs. When the dumplings are served up by the maidservant, all the people at uh, at, uh, at table cry, Suze, S-U-umlaut Z. Uh, Suze, 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 that being the cry used in calling pigs. Sometimes after dinner, the man who, quote, carried the pig, unquote, has his face blackened and is set on a cart and drawn around the village by his fellows, followed by a crowd singing Suze, 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 as if they were calling swine. Sometimes after being wheeled around the village, he is flung on the dunghill. I kid you not, folks. Wow. <laughs> no, no. Brian. What's your name? Brian. Brian. Brian? No, Brian. <laughs> Again, the corn spirit in the form of a pig plays his part at sowing time as well as at harvest. At New Oats in Courland, when barley is sown for the first time in the year, the farmer's wife boils the chine of a pig along with the tail and brings it to the sower on the field. He eats of it, but cuts off the tail and sticks it in the field. It is believed that the ears of corn will then grow as long as the tail. Here the pig is the corn spirit. That's a tall tale. <laughs> See what it did there? <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Here the pig is the corn spirit, whose fertilizing power is sometimes supposed to lie, especially in his tail. As a pig is put in the ground at sowing time, you see how I keep laughing at my own jokes for ages afterwards while nobody else is laughing. I'll just carry on, shall I? As a pig, he is put in the ground at sowing time, and as a pig, he reappears among the ripe corn at harvest. For amongst the neighboring Estonians, with a H in it, so not Estonians, Estonians. As we have seen, the last chief is called the Rybor. Somewhat similar customs are observed in Germany. In the Salza district near Meiningen, a certain bone in the pig is called, quote, the Jew on the winnowing fan, unquote. The flesh of this bone is boiled on Shrove Tuesday, but the bone is put amongst the ashes, which the neighbours exchange as presents on St. Peter's Day, the 22nd of February. 
and then mix with the seed corn. In the whole of Hess, Meiningen and other districts, people eat pea soup with dried pig ribs on Ash Wednesday or Candlemas. The ribs are then collected and hung in the room till sowing time when they are inserted in the sown field or in the seed bag amongst the flaxseed. This is thought to be an infallible specific against earth fleas and moles and to cause the flax to grow well and tall. Uh, Ria says hello from Minnesota in the USA. A very good afternoon to you, Ria. Thank you for joining us. Barbara gives us the groan emoji for the, the uh, tall tale joke. Yes, yes, yes. They say, you know, when you make a mess of something, oh, he made a right pig's ear of that. What is it that you do when you make a pig's tail of it? But the idea of the corn spirit as embodied in pig form is nowhere more clearly expressed than in the Scandinavian custom of the Yule boar. In Sweden and Denmark, at Yule, Christmas, it is the custom to take a loaf. Sorry, <laughs> to bake a loaf. To take a loaf. That sounds like something. That sounds like toilet humor. Never mind. Don't go there. Keep your heads out of the gutter, folks. I'll try to do likewise. We're all in the gutter. Some of us are looking at the stars. The uh, This is called the Yule boar. Uh, is it a custom to bake a loaf in the form of a boar pig called the Yule boar? The corn of the last sheaf is often used to make it. All through Yule, the Yule boar stands on the table. Often it is kept till the sowing time in spring. Sorry, I was taking a note there. When part of it is mixed with the seed corn and part given to the ploughman and plough horses and plough oxen to eat in the expectation of a good harvest. In this custom, the corn spirit imminent in the last sheaf appears at midwinter in the form of a boar made from the corn of the last sheaf. And his quickening influ influence on the corn is shown by mixing part of the Yule boar with the seed corn and giving part of it to the ploughman and his cattle to eat. I'm just wondering here in my own mind, but I might as well say it out loud. I'm just wondering, what is the possibility that these are customs that go right back into prehistory? These aren't just 18th and early uh, 19th and early 20th century customs that these are customs that have a long, long, long um, uh, history, uh, a long incubation that perhaps, um, you know, I mean, agriculture began in the Neolithic. I don't know. We have myths here in the Boyne Valley pertaining to cows and bulls and uh, pigs, boars. Uh, you know, uh, we have traditions around, you know, the harvest and sowing and the beginning of winter and all the rest. Uh, I just wonder, I'm just wondering out loud. Of course, we could never prove it one way or, or another, I suppose. But it, 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 it is fascinating. And we also have the dismemberment thing in the Boyne Valley as well. And remember, the Boyne Valley monuments were built by uh, Neolithic farmers. Uh, and clearly, they I think it's quite clear from the Boyne Valley monuments that they had been quite successful at, or relatively or reasonably successful at farming. They must have had quite a surplus to be able to build such huge monuments. Similarly, we saw that the corn wolf makes his appearance at midwinter, the time when the year begins to verge towards spring. Formerly, a re real boar was sacrificed at Christmas and apparently also a man in the character of the Yule boar. This, at least, may perhaps be inferred from a Christmas custom still observed in Sweden. A man is wrapped up in a skin and carries a wisp of straw in his mouth so that the projecting straws look like the bristles of a boar. A knife is brought and an old woman with her face blackened pretends to sacrifice him. Interesting stuff. And yes, almost what seems almost certainly the survival of a, 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 of, of a custom with a more deadly intent, as it were. And McCallum says, I would say that these are all absolutely very old customs. I would imagine so. Centuries old, at least. For sure, ancient, says uh, Valerie. I'm wondering if there's a star formation that looks like corn or a scythe. What about the plough? 
Tolkien also suggested this theory about history being older. Yeah, and Tolkien was a linguist. I mean, I think he would have known quite a lot about the age of words and stories. Seems cow customs must predate horse customs. I'm not sure what order uh, uh, cattle and, and, and horses appeared in various European countries, but I know in the Neolithic, uh, I think cattle and horses appeared at pretty much the same time here, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody may correct me on that, but there were no horses or cows in Ireland before the Neolithic. Uh, Michael says, yes, it's fascinating. The Yule boar of the Nordics mix it with seed. These customs seem very ancient and half forgotten. The boar was a tribal symbol of some warrior Celts of the Iron Age. Tolkien did his research. I'm also thinking about the fact that uh, one of the old romantic names of Ireland was Boar Island or Hog Island uh, because of the fact that when the Milesians were arriving, one of the things that the Tua de Danon uh, did uh, were to disguise themselves as giant boars uh, that looked like the hills of Ireland um, to, to put the Milesians off the notion that there was anyone in the country, you know. On Christmas Eve, in some parts of the Estonian island of Oysel, they bake a long cake with the two ends turned up. It is called the Christmas boar and stands on the table till the morning of New Year's Day, when it is distributed among the cattle. In other parts of the island, the Christmas boar is not a cake, but a little pig born in March, which the housewife fattens secretly often without the knowledge of the other members of the family. Well, how do you keep a pig secret from a family in olden times when houses were small and such things weren't easily concealed? On Christmas Eve, the little pig is secretly killed, then roasted in the oven and set on the table, standing on all fours, where it remains in this posture for several days. It wouldn't remain in that posture in our house because, first of all, the humans would carve it up and, secondly, the dogs would get at it. In other parts of this island, again, uh, uh, I'm joking, by the way. That was uh, poor humour on my part. Uh, though the Christmas cake has neither the name nor shape of a boar, it is kept till the new year, when half of it is divided among all the members and all the quadrupeds of the family. The aforementioned doggies and cats, perhaps, included Desiree um, and um, Barb and Sue and all of the other doggy owners who were telling us and... and uh, uh, was it Alan and all the other uh, animal owners who are watching? The other half of the cake is kept till sowing time comes around, when it is similarly distributed in the morning among human beings and beasts. In other parts of es Estonia, again, I keep saying, you know, emphasizing the H, Estonia, again, the Christmas boar, as it is called, is baked of the first rye cut at harvest. It has a conical shape and a cross is impressed into it with a pig's bone or a key or three dints are made in it with a buckle or a piece of charcoal. It stands with a light beside it on the table all through the festal season. On New Year's Day and Epiphany, before sunrise, a little of the cake is crumbled with salt and given to the cattle. The rest is kept till the day when the cattle are driven out to pasture for the first time in spring. It is then put in the herdsman's bag and at evening is divided among the cattle to guard them from magic and harm. In some places, the Christmas boar is partaken of by farm servants and cattle at the time of the barley sowing for the purpose of thereby producing a heavier crop. I, I, I'm not sure, uh, Brendan, but I, I do know that, you know, uh, the last two of the Danon kings were Macool, Macecht and Magrania, uh, son of the hazel, son of the plough and son of the sun, which I find fascinating because it's to do with food, agriculture and uh, the sun, the weather, the growing uh, of, of crop, you know. Yeah, Robin Edgar is asking, wasn't corn, as in maize, only introduced into Europe after the discovery of the Americas? Uh, in any case, cows and bulls have been closely associated with the moon and sun for millennia because their horns are anal analogous with the crescent moon and crescent sun that is seen during solar eclipse. Also, the curving tusks of the uh, uh, the, the boar, uh, which I think, was it Campbell or was it um, Iliadi? I read that in, I think it was Campbell was talking about that they were the symbols of the last and first crescent moon. And um, there are some other reasons above and beyond this. Um, yet, yeah, uh, maize, uh, 
I think generally when we say corn, uh, of course, farmers, uh, tillage farmers in Ireland know exactly what they're planting and, and what they're sowing and reaping. Um, but uh, when we say corn, we're talking about the crops of of, of wheat uh, and um, um, sorry, mind blank, uh, barley and oats, etc. Um, well, we don't mean specifically the corn as in as in the corn as it is meant in America, as in maize. Wheat or barley, asks Helen. In what context, uh, Helen? Wheat or barley, what? I'm not sure what the question is. Um, Thor's chariot is pulled by two boars, says Spike Willow. That it has to be a, a solar chariot. The two boars being the, the, the last and, and first crescent of the moon, either side of the sun. Wow. You know? In other cultures, did the plough relate to other food sources? Couldn't tell you is the honest answer. And don't, don't don't have enough knowledge. So maybe somebody else could answer that. Ah, yes, Helen saying not maize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So we, we don't. I, I think only people who are sort of not knowledgeable of farming in Ireland would refer to the harvesting of corn, you know. Um, uh, Robin almost mentioned the bear tusks too. Not to stick to what's well established, but I agree. There you go. Very interesting conversation going on in the comments. I have two pages to run, so I think we're in good uh, time anyway. And I hope you're all enjoying yourselves and having fun. Hope all the pets are too. Saskia is extremely relaxed on her chair. So much for the animal embodiments of the corn spirit as they are presented to us in the folk customs of Northern Europe. These customs bring out clearly the sacramental character of the harvest supper. The corn spirit is conceived as embodied in an animal. This divine animal is slain and its flesh and blood are partaken of by the harvesters. Thus, the cock, the hare, the cat, the goat and the ox are eaten sacramentally by the harvester and the pig is eaten sacramentally by ploughmen in spring. Again, as a substitute for the real flesh of the divine being, bread or dumplings are made in his image and eaten sacramentally. Uh, have we seen this bread made in the image and, and eaten sacramentally? What are we talking about here, folks, except for the Eucharist? Thus, pig-shaped dumplings are eaten by the harvesters and loaves made in boar shape, the Yule boar, are eaten in spring by the plowman and his cattle. The reader has probably remarked the complete parallel, par, parallelism, parallelism, parallelism. Let me try that again. The reader has probably remarked the complete parallelism between the conceptions of the corn spirit in human and in animal form. Bear in mind, folks, uh, we, we, we did not read a significant part of this chapter, uh, the earlier part. The parallel may be here briefly resumed. When the corn waves in the wind, it is said that the corn mother or that the corn wolf, etc., is passing through the corn. Now, remember, so just on that discussion about corn and what it means, earlier we were saying that it really depended on the crop. You know, the the the, uh, the wheat sow or the barley sow, etc., or the beans sow, etc. So I think corn is just that catch-all uh, word to describe uh, crops in general. Well, sorry, when the corn waves in the wind, it is said either that the corn mother mother, or that the corn wolf, etc., is passing through the corn. Children are warned against straying in cornfields, either because the corn mother or because the corn wolf, etc., is there. And of course, you can see the practical, uh, the practical application of that, which is you don't want children wandering through the crop and stamping it down and damaging it because you want to preserve as much of it as possible. In the last corn cut or the last sheaf threshed, either the corn mother or the corn wolf, etc., is supposed to be present. 
The last sheaf is itself called the corn mother or the corn wolf, etc., and is made up in the shape either of a woman or of, of a wolf, etc. And again, parallels with Ireland, where the last uh, uh, of the, 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 the wheat crop, as it were, was made into, uh, was it a corn dolly? It was called, I think. Am I right? Is that, is that mistake? And called the Kalyuk. It was made into what look, might have been said to look like a corn doll, uh, and that was the Kalyuk. Uh, Anne says, in Scotland, we always called all these crops corn. They were all cornfields. It was an eye opener when I saw the actual cornfield in Canada. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, cereals, says Eva. Yes, exactly. Cereals. Uh, the majority uh, of uh, cereals grown in Ireland, the huge majority by a long way, are wheat and barley. Uh, there's a sm much smaller area sown in, in oats. There's some beans. We actually, I've seen in some fields, corn, as in corn on the cob. Uh, I've seen, uh, of course, we have some potato uh, crops. I'm just trying to think, is there anything else? Oh, um, the brassica, what's it called? Um, uh, oil seed rape, or, or uh, you know, the yellow uh, rapeseed um, that flowers, I think, in April, or is it already May? Um, but it's not harvested until the summer. Fascinating stuff. We'll be seeing all that hopefully again soon in a few months. The person who cuts, binds, or threshes the last sheaf is called either the old woman or the old wolf, etc., according to the name bestowed on the sheaf itself. As in some places, a sheaf in human form, as in some places, a sheaf made in human form and called the maiden, the mother of the maize, etc., is kept from one harvest to the next in order to secure a continuance of the corn spirit's blessing. So in some places the harvest cock and in others the flesh of the goat is kept for a similar purpose from one harvest to the other. As in some places the grain taken from the corn mother is mixed with the seed corn in spring to make the crop abundant. So in some places the feathers of the cock and in Sweden the yule boar are kept till spring and mixed with the seed corn for a like purpose. As part of the corn mother or maiden is given to the cattle at Christmas or to the horses at the first ploughing, so part of the yule boar is given to the ploughing horses or oxen in spring. Lastly, the death of the corn spirit is represented by killing or pretending to kill either his human or his animal representative. And the worshippers partake sacramentally either of the actual body and blood of the, or of the representative of the divinity or of a bread made in his likeness. Catholicism and uh, transubstantiation, anyone? <laughs> either the actual body and blood or bread made in his likeness. Ah, oh, there you go. I, in fairness, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Eucharist uh, is not circular little wafers. They're hardly made in, in the image of himself. But anyway grains michael trot says uh no gmo crops while we're at it canola is the newer name for rapes rapeseed apparently yeah i think um um it's it, it, it's commonly called osr here oil seed raper uh rapeseed um but i think it's a brassica brassica napus is the scientific name Rapeseed, also known as rape or oilseed rape, is a bright yellow flowering member of the family Brass, Brassica Chea. Brassica Chea, is that how you pronounce that? Cultivated mainly for its oil rich seed, which naturally contains appreciable amounts of uh, urusic acid. Uh, by the way, just a, a side note there is a company here in the Boyne Valley called Newgrange Gold, and they plant and harvest oilseed rape here in the Boyne Valley and make uh, uh you know cooking uh oils uh, uh very uh, beautiful uh, oils uh, i know because i have tried them um and a, a very good uh, friend of mine is uh, uh the chief i think of that company um and uh, yeah uh, should, should actually follow them 
on uh, on Facebook or on Instagram. New Grange Gold, uh, it's called. Other animal forms assumed by the corn spirit are the fox, stag, roe, sheep, bear, ass, mouse, quail, stork, swan, and kite. It's in relation to the swan immediately, isn't it? Tons of swan mythology in the Boyne Valley. If it is asked why the corn spirit should be thought to appear in the form of an animal, and of so many different animals, we may reply that to primitive man, the simple appearance of an animal or bird among the corn is probably enough to suggest a mysterious link between the creature and the corn. And when we remember that in the old days before fields were fenced in, all kinds of animals must have been free to roam over them. We need not wonder that the corn spirit should have been identified even with large animals like the horse and cow, which nowadays could not, except by a rare accident, be found straying in an English cornfield. This ex or an Irish one for that matter. This explanation applies with peculiar force to the very common case in which the animal embodiment of the corn spirit is believed to lurk in the last standing corn. For at harvest, a number of wild animals, such as hares, rabbits, and partridges, are commonly driven by the progress of the reaping into, into the last patch of standing corn. Makes sense, doesn't it? That's their refuge, their hiding place, and make their escape from it as it is being cut down. So regularly does this happen, that reapers and others often stand round the last patch of corn armed with sticks or guns, with which they kill the animals as they dart out of their last refuge among the stalks. It's very nasty. Why not just kind of scare them off and let them free? Now, a primitive man to whom magical changes of shape seem perfectly credible finds it most natural that the spirit of the corn driven from his home in the ripe grain should make his escape in the form of the animal which is seen to rush out of the last patch of corn as it falls under the scythe of the reaper. Thus, the identification of the corn spirit with an animal is analogous to the identification of him with a passing stranger. As the sudden appearance of a stranger near the harvest field or threshing floor is, to the primitive mind, enough to identify him as the spirit of the corn escaping from the cut or threshed corn, so the sudden appearance of an animal issuing from the cut corn is enough to identify it with the corn spirit escaping from his ruined home. The two identifications are so analogous that they can hardly be dis disassociated in any attempt to explain them. Those who look to some other principle than the one here suggested for the explanation of the latter identification are bound to show that their theory covers the former identification also. Fascinating stuff. That brings to mind, I don't know why I've made this connection, but there's a book that I think will make a couple of very nice episodes, uh, perhaps beginning next week. Um, which was written by a person that I knew who's, who's deceased now, a father, Sean O'Dunn um, of Glenstall Abbey, who was known by his peers, his fellow monks, as the Druid, um, in search of the awesome mystery, I think is what it is called. Uh, I think I did show this before, and I am extremely lucky and blessed to have a signed copy uh, signed to me uh, by Aunt Tahir, uh Sean O'Dwin, uh, while he was still alive. Um, so um, that's a great, uh, a great honor. Um, now, the reason I bring this up, and I may have read from this before, is I'm pretty sure. Yep, yeah, here we go. Straight away, I found it because I have it highlighted. So I'm going to just do very quickly read a little bit of this, but I will select a couple of chapters of this book to be read as episodes this is a beautiful book folks this is written by um you know uh, uh ostensibly a christian monk um but uh, uh, sean o'dwin was uh, a remarkable scholar uh, very well respected uh, uh inside and outside of uh, his christian community uh, for his deep knowledge of the older older druidic ways as it were uh, and the myths and legends um I'm just going to read this bit. Yeah, I could read a whole chapter here that would really be a nice continuation of what we were just saying. And I'm just going to read this this part because it's, it's it directly relates to what we. I, I hope this is the part that relates. 
yeah, so I'll, I'll read this maybe a bit faster. Uh, Kathy May Dayo is going back to work. Have a great day, Kathy May. Great to see you, and uh, hope to see you on the next live stream. Thank you for joining us. Have a have a wonderful day. Um, what in English? What is called in English the Woodford River flows past these sites associated with Crum Croich. In the original Irish, it bears the significant name of Gráinne, a name familiar with the romance of Torriof Gyrmuda August Gráinne. The uh, uh, the, what is it? The, the, the romantic, the romance of German Negro, the romantic chase of German Negro, the pursuit, isn't it? In which Gronia escapes from her intended husband, Fionn McCool, and elopes with the hero, Jermud O'Duvne. The medieval romance, however, may hint that Gronia, with her predilection for her alternating husbands, was originally a goddess. The name is possibly associated with Grain, Gron, or Ugliness, Gromacht. Its significance in this. Uh, uh, cultic context is that Gráinne the river is, like nearly all rivers in Ireland, feminine. Now, presumably, like other gods, such as Andagda's marriage to the Moriagon, or the more Morrigan, the Morion, at the river uh, uh, Ineas, as described in Kotmaitura, and likewise Lou's marriage to Boy after his great victory over Balor of the Evil Eye, Crum Croic, in another guise, in the same battle. Uh, and that's from Tukmark Emera, the wooing of Emer. It is reasonable to suppose, suppose that Crum, the corn god, also married a goddess. This marriage could be expressed in different ways. The most obvious one is the custom of the Kalyak, or last sheaf of the harvest. This is a well known usage in Ireland, England, and Scotland, and involved special attention to the very last sheaf in the last cornfield of the farm to be re reaped. It was felt that this was the grain goddess who was being evicted from her own domain, so that a certain degree of reluctance accompanied the cutting of the last piece of corn in which she had been forced to take refuge. In some places, the last piece of standing corn was bound in the middle, and the mowers stood back and threw their sickles at it, uh, as if to avoid as far as possible personal responsibility for killing the goddess. The Kalyak, uh, brackets old hag, was brought home and hung up in the house, or sometimes buried in the land, or sometimes the grains were taken off the straw and mixed with the seed grain for next year's harvest. Doesn't it all sound very familiar, folks? In other words, the Kalyak joined the corn god in marriage to ensure next week, next year's harvest, even not next week's, next year's. Adele Perth has joined us almost at the end. Adele, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Hope you are keeping well. Not sure if you were here last week. If not, happy new year. And if so, happy new year again. Hope you're in good form. In some places, the last sheaf was called the bride or the oats bride or the wheat bride. And in parts of Germany, the corn spirit was personified in double form as an oats bridegroom and an oats bride, both swathed in straw like the straw boys in Ireland. They danced together at the Harvest Festival. Is that what the Mummers is about on St. Stephen's Day? Uh, fascinating. <clears throat> and I could go on, but I will next week, I think, uh, read from In Search of the Awesome Mystery, Lore of Megalithic, Celtic and Christian Ireland by the wonderful, uh, the late Antahar Sean Andoin, the Druid. Any comments, questions, anything else, folks, do remember to check out the uh, merchandise uh, at the uh, link uh, that is scrolling along the bottom of the screen. Um, all sorts of, all manner of nice stuff uh, from mouse mats and mugs to T-shirts, pillowcases, posters, jigsaws and water bottles. So there you all are. Yes. Another fascinating episode, says Anne. Thank you, Anthony. Just wondering if, in addition to the Macmillan edition that you are reading, do you also have the Oxford World's Classic edition? Yes, I, I think that was the other one I had, wasn't it? That, that I mentioned last week. Hang on, I just uh, quickly, just trying to remember where I put it. Uh, I do have another edition. Uh, I need to quickly, very quickly, Anthony, figure out where I put it. Ah, there it is. Uh, no, that's the Wordsworth reference uh, version that I have. Uh, um, uh, let me see what you're asking that you were reading. Do you also have the Oxford Is is that an expanded edition? There more is there more in that than in the one I've been reading? And I wonder. Um, of 
corn spirit. Let me just quickly see if I can. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to sort of do a more detailed check as to whether that is the same. Because I know that the Golden Bell was a much bigger work. Was it 12 volumes? And uh, what we have there is an, an abridged version of the entire work in one volume. So enjoy following where the thoughts on library lead you, says Valerie. And I'm glad, you know, I think it's all fascinating. I know some of it's very antiquated, some of it's a bit mysterious, and some of it's kind of does seem a little bit downright primitive, sometimes savage. Uh, but it's all part of trying to get into the, the mind of the past. I'm, I'm loving the comparative stuff. I'm loving seeing the comparisons. Uh, now that I'm more familiar with Irish myths than I was 20 years ago, uh, being able to look at European and and African and 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 um, Oriental and and Native American mythology, it's amazing that the the amount of parallels that are there, and sometimes, of course, the differences are quite extreme too. Mary, who I did not say hello to, because I'm not sure if you said hello already. Mary, uh, free reading, yes, indeed. Uh, Mary, uh, great delight to see you on the live stream. Uh, thank you, Nick. Have a very uh, lovely evening, and uh, please do join us next time. Uh, Mariana Dunn, um, enjoy the episode, plus learning about our MI friends, furry ones. Yeah, we'll have to do a Zoom at some point in which we just literally talk about our pets and uh, maybe introduce them and show them off, you know. Agreed, Mythical Island pets, as often as awesome as they're human, says Desire. Yes. And Monica says, I could listen to that stuff all night long. Yeah. All night long. Do, 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 do. Um, one more joke. No, my joke book isn't there. Can I remember one? I I uh, told I thought that volcano one was brilliant. You know, uh, what was? Bear with me one moment, Lee. I'm terrible at remembering jokes. I used to be brilliant. I could spend several hours when I was younger telling jokes. Um, I'm not saying that the people would spend. Oh yes, the swordfish has few predators to worry about in the wild, except for the seldom seen penfish which is said to be even mightier. Ah, good on you, Del. I hope you're keeping well down there. And a very good morning to you, by the way. Uh, delighted to see you, as always. Always a pleasure. Catons uh, S says, good night all. Thank you for joining us. Happy New Year to you. And um, we'll see you again very soon, hopefully. Uh, I think I'll say good night now, says Brendan. So I'm not the last, and thus won't get thrown in the big story. <laughs> I'll probably be the last. Ah, oh, typical. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ikawa says Adrian Obeglin. Uh, Adrian, a very good night to you, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, Paul Campbell is in there. I'm not sure if I said hello to you earlier, Paul, um, but I think I did. But maybe I didn't. And if I didn't, I apologize. But hello to you. He says at the end of the episode, Tom King enjoyed that. Thank you so much, Anthony and the Mighty Tua. Take care, my friends. Until the next time. Uh, the stout forge, uh, the stout flame is lit in the in the forge of the smooth road. A, a light for all of the northeast, beaming across the ancient plain of Brega. Robin says, uh, thank you for another great show. Really enjoyed this. Have a good day slash night. See you all next time. Yes, indeed. I think I... Uh, would uh, uh, almost uh, I think I would repeat those sentiments uh, thank you everybody for joining us I hope you all had a wonderful time don't forget to check out the uh, merchandise on the Mythical Ireland website something might interest you it might be a gift idea for someone as well I certainly would love uh, on the next Zoom event that we have uh, or the next Mythical Ireland public tour for instance to see lots of people wearing t-shirts uh, saying uh, I watch Live Irish Myths uh, and perhaps should design some hoodies as well because <clears throat> it might be a little bit early in the year for us to be wearing t-shirts in this part of the world. Elaine Dent Lingenfelder says, here's one for you. There was a man who heard a woman being mean to her kids. He asked if they are twins. He replied, no, are you stupid? He says, well, uh, oh, well, I just couldn't imagine anyone sleeping with you twice. <laughs> <laughs> Slow, Michael. Have a great day uh, in Auckland, and thank you for joining us. Uh, and with that, apart from the usual 
mention of uh, perhaps you might consider becoming a patron of Mythical Ireland. Uh, patrons of Mythical Ireland are treated to uh, early and exclusive access uh, to photographs, uh, blog posts, uh, videos, uh, podcasts, uh, news, all sorts of stuff um, uh, uh, that is not often seen by others. Um, so uh, please do consider becoming a patron, supporting Mythical Ireland and getting uh, 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 bonus material for it. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Slánag is banacht. Slánga fól. Ika wak and most importantly, toka Take it easy.